So I'm going to talk to you about dead birds. Um, and of course, that's, that's such an appropriate topic while everybody is eating dinner. Um, and I hope everybody has a, a, a nice beverage to go along with that to, to wash things down. Um, so this is my husky here. Um, so it's my UW dead bird slide. <coughs> um, and, and I kind of want to um, talk to you about just this thing, that is, what do dead birds uh, really have to tell us about? Um, and this is a good place to start. So this is a lot of words, and I, I can distill them for you easily. The first paragraph is all of the really horrific things that are happening, right? And the second paragraph basically says, gosh, in order to do something about this, we need good science, right? And if we don't have good science, we're really likely to make bad decisions about um, what to do about environmental issues. Uh, and this message we're hearing from lots and lots of different places. And so this leads one to ask the question, or it leads me to ask the question, okay, well, fine. So if we need science, we need scientists. How many scientists do we actually have in the world? And let's, let's extend that out and ask how many STEM professionals. So STEM is this big thing that means science, technology, engineering, and math. So let's, let's add up all of those people, all of the professors, and let's extend that out to the real world. So everybody who's in a STEM profession, and the answer is about five million, give or take, maybe even a million, right? And so if you think about that, this is a little bit of an old figure, so let's just say six million, okay? And so that's about 0.1% of the entire world's population. And so honestly, we're not gonna get very far if we just use STEM professionals. And that's one of the reasons to use citizens because amazingly enough, while only some people are STEM professionals, everybody is a citizen of somewhere, right? And, and everybody lives somewhere and everybody sees what's going on in your local backyard um, and there is a good reason to get involved. Um, so these are some reasons <coughs> and that is data collection. If we have people out there collecting data, we can have a lot more data than if we just have scientists doing it. Um, and also, people can talk to decision makers. So it's hard for a professor to call up the gov and say, Chris, I really need you to do something but if she gets letters from citizens, then she's far more likely to do something. So what are the roots of citizen science? Here's one really good starting place. So um, a great, um, I guess more than 100 years ago, about 120 years ago, Frank Chapman, sitting in New York City, um, at the time in New York City, a lot fewer people, and a big thing to do at Christmas was, if you were male, to get your gun and go to Central Park. And shoot as many birds as you could, hence the term bag limit. Um, and you put them all in a bag and you walk out of the park and the guy that had the most birds in the bag won, right? And Frank thought, this is a dumb idea. We're shooting all of the birds and we like birds. Um, and so he said, how about instead of shooting the birds, we count the birds? And so he started the very first Audubon Christmas bird count. And the very first one was done in Central Park. Um, and also in Princeton, New Jersey that year. And more than 100 years later, we have hundreds of thousands of people that are involved um, in Christmas bird count. And so here are some data um, from the bird count. And you can see for this guy here, this is a wren, we have graphs that look like this. And I can tell you on this x-axis here is time, lots and lots of years. And on the y-axis here is the latitudinal gradient. So what does this graph tell you? This graph tells you that over time, the center range of this bird has moved north. That is to say, it's responding to climate change and global warming. And that's what citizen data can get you. That science data can't because there aren't enough graduate students in the world to collect all of those um, data. So we think a lot about um, citizen involvement and, and citizen data, and we kind of come up with this schema of how to get involved. There are lots and lots and lots of citizen programs. You can go out, out and you can clean up a beach or you can restore a place, you can rip out the invasive uh, plant species. But in order to be involved in citizen science, you have to collect information. It has to be data. Um, and we say it has to be verifiable. And that makes it rigorous citizen science. And rigorous citizen science is science where there's a marriage between the scientists and the citizens. So we don't say we have citizen scientists, we say we've got citizens and scientists. And they work together to collect 
verify, analyze, and report out rigorous data. Not ethereal, string theory kind of physics data that you wouldn't understand, and not monitoring data that doesn't make any difference anyway, but data that we can actually use in science and decision making. And that's what COAST is about. So COAST, with two S's, um, is a rigorous citizen science project at the University of Washington. And we're in partnership with all sorts of different programs. Kind of anybody who will talk with us, we are happy to call a partner. Um, and in COAST, we train people to go out to local beaches, um, place they have an affinity for, and walk the beach in a standardized fashion and find, and this is a geeky thing, dead birds that have washed up on the tide, and we give you the tools and the know-how to identify them. Okay, why do that? Who, who cares about birds and, and who cares about dead birds? Well, Puget Sound Partnership does, um, and local agencies do, and federal agencies do as well. And that's because um, when we look at marine birds in Puget Sound, we can see, according to the State of the Sound reports, that they're um, over in the negative here of indicators. That is, there are lots of species that we're seeing less and less and less of. So seabirds are sort of a negative. They're in a bad place, and we're using them to indicate that there are problems with the sound and thus something that we have to do about it. Okay, so that's live birds. But why identify dead birds? Isn't that kind of an odd thing? Well, of course, they were once alive, obvious. And depending on where you are, there are a lot of them. So not so many here in Puget Sound, but you go to the outer coast beaches in Grays Harbor, for instance, Long Beach Peninsula, along the coast of Oregon, and there are tens to occasionally hundreds of dead birds that'll wash up at certain times of year. Now, unlike a live bird, a dead bird can be identified by anybody. You don't have to have specialized training to identify a dead bird. In fact, like this dead bird right here, they will wait patiently for you to find them. Um, you do not have to get up early in the morning to go out and find a dead bird. You have to know something about the tide, but other than that, uh, they will wait for you. You do not need binoculars or a spotting scope, right? You don't need to buy fancy camo outfits so that the birds won't see you. Um, you can just walk right up, um, and if you put on gloves, you can thoroughly examine them. You can pick them up. You can ruffle their feathers. They will not mind a bit. Uh, and collectively, they contain a lot of valuable information. So if we were just looking at one bird, we probably couldn't say much. We can play CSI and figure out how it died. Um, but when we have a program where we're looking at not hundreds, but thousands of birds a year, then we can start to put together some patterns. So I want to tell you a little bit about who COAST is, and then I want to tell you some science stories that come from COAST. So, this is who COAST is. Right now we've got about 650 volunteers and they are out manning the beaches on a monthly basis. They send us data every month except for the volunteers way up in Alaska and that's because the ocean ices over in the northern part of the coast range um, in the wintertime. Um, we have about 12 uh, student interns um, including Nathan who is here tonight. Say hi Nathan. Um, and four uh, staff and all of us work together um, to collect information. If you look at our volunteers, um, a bunch of them are retired, and that makes sense. Retired people have more time to devote to a whole range of projects, um, including citizen science projects. But we have people that come from all sorts of science professions as well, from business, from education, um, a whole bunch of medical professionals. A bunch of people are self-employed, and then we have a whole tale of other kinds of people. So. This is to tell you that coasters um, come from all walks of life. Um, average age is about 58, and that makes sense, again, um, given the fact that we have retirees. Um, that age changes. On the outer coast, it's higher. You get here into Puget Sound, and we get younger participants. You get up into Alaska, and the age goes down. And this I take to mean that nobody retires to the Pribilof Islands, right? Um, you retire out to the to the coast of California or, or Oregon. And we also have a few more female participants than, than male participants. Of course, I say that's because females are smarter, but um, this is actually just a demographic thing. Uh, females actually live a little longer uh, than men do, so this reflects also our age trend. So here's a map of coast. 
Um, and these are all of the areas that, um, that we work in. So you can see the colored regions here. C Canada, by the way, has been cut out of this map. Um, so coast goes down to Humboldt County in California, that purple up around into Puget Sound and the San Juans, picks up in southeast, goes all the way out the Aleutian Islands to the Commander Islands. Those are actually in Russian territory. Um, and then up and actually sneaks right around here up into the Chukchi Sea. So we cover a few thousand miles of coastline. This is a map of Washington blown up. You can see here the San Juans blown up here. Um, and you can see that we have beaches all over the place. We've been going for about 13 years. And we have about 650 volunteers manning about 320 beaches. They have found over 30,000 carcasses of over 135 species. So that's a lot of um, information. And here's how Coast works. We recruit and train local citizens, so we go there. Um, just about every week of the year, we're somewhere giving a talk or doing a training. Um, we arm them with a, a protocol, a field guide, some data sheets. We train them for about five hours. We have a smart data input on our website, and this is our website, www.coastwith2s.org. Um, and then um, all of the data that they input are verified by our, uh, by our experts. And we also analyze and present those data out. So if you become a coaster and sign up, you will not only get the incredible Coast Annual Report. This is bedtime reading, I assure you. Um, you will also get the not quite quarterly newsletter, The Coastline. And most importantly, you will receive the Coast Holiday Card. Now, you might think that it would be rather difficult for a dead bird program to send out a tasteful holiday card, but we managed to do it um, on an annual basis. In fact, this is the favorite publication of our volunteers. They start to um, contact us in October wondering what the next holiday card is, is going to say. So I'll just leave it at that and if you sign up, you'll get one. Now, when identifying dead birds, we had to come up with a field guide because dead birds don't do a few things that live birds do. They don't fly and they don't sing. Uh, and those are two ways that we identify live birds. So we had to invent a dead bird field guide. And the other thing that we really wanted to do is we wanted to make it a dead bird guide for the rest of us. Not a geeky science field guide, but something that your grandmother could take out to the coast and use and be successful with. So of course it doesn't really look like this, although I wish it did. Um, it looks like this. Um, we actually have three field guides. It's my biggest selling publication. We have one for the West Coast, another one for Alaska, and we actually have another one for the Northeast Atlantic. Um, so years after I retire, I am absolutely certain that no one will read my peer-reviewed scientific publications, but I know that I will have tens of thousands of dead bird field guides um, still in circulation. So if you open this field guide, um, this takes you through the easy steps of dead bird identification. And that starts with feet. Uh, we refer to this as the dim sum principle. And that is that nobody wants to eat the feet. Um, they stay on the table for longest. And they actually stay on the carcasses because none of the scavengers want to eat them. And feet can tell you a lot about what a bird is. So you identify the feet. You make three easy measurements um, uh, of the bird. And most importantly, you take a photograph. Now, here's another really great thing about dead birds. You can pose them. You cannot do this with a live bird, but with a dead bird, you can pose them, you can fill the frame, just like your photography teacher told you to do, um, and you can put a ruler in there for scale. Uh, so dead bird photography, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a lost art. Um, we have the largest collection of dead bird photographs, almost 100,000. Um, I have to say, uh, so the things you learn about in science. How accurate are our coasters when they use the field guide? Pretty darn accurate. So um, our coasters can get to species about 89%, about 90% of the time. And we know that because we've got all those other data, those measurements, the foot type, 
um, that, that, um, that photograph. We can best that and get, push that right up over 90%. This makes us the most accurate beach bird uh, program in the world, and I know what you're thinking. You're probably the only beach bird <laughs> program in the world, and that's actually not true. Um, we have beach bird programs in uh, a lot of them in Europe and in um, New Zealand and, uh, and Australia that have been going on for a lot of, a lot of time. But we are the largest. Um, at, you know, it's an American thing. Uh, and we are also, uh, we are also the, most, the most accurate. And we also use our data um, in science and, and in decision making. And so I'm going to tell you just a few short stories about how our data are used. Because, I mean, think about it. If you're a volunteer and you're out there month after month and it's cold and wet, you know, in the Pacific Northwest in the winter, you want to make sure that your time and effort is being used wisely. So here's one so what um, of dead birds, and that's monitoring the effects of oil pollution. So here's a graph that shows um, what birds wash in after an oil spill. And there's a, a fair-sized oil spill uh, a little um, less often than uh, every decade. Um, so these are data from um, the, nest, or the new Carissa spill um, that happened on the coast of Oregon. And common MERS, um, this is a bird that breeds um, in the Pacific Northwest, is by far the dominant species um, uh, in, in an oil spill. And then there's a whole long list of birds that go afterwards. Now, what do coast volunteers find on the beach when there's not an oil spill? So here's a graph of that. Interestingly enough, you can see that common MERS are also very, very prevalent. Um, and that reflects the fact that they breed here. But these data were collected year round. So if we take these coast data that are collected year round and we just gate them and ask, well, what if we just take the months when there was an oil spill? And what if we just take the beaches where there was an oil spill. So we're looking in space and time, and we're saying, well, what birds wash in right there um, year after year? Forming the baseline, asking us, letting us ask the question, well, what's normal? And then we can see how different things are. So this is a graph that shows that. Um, and on this axis here, I'm showing you another oil spill, the Nestucca spill that happened in Washington. And here are data from coast surveys in the same place in the same time of year. This is the one-to-one -one line. So if a dot falls on this line, that means we get the same percentage um, in coast and in the oil spill. And we're looking at the species. And I want to just highlight two, common MERS and northern fulmars. So again, look at that line and realize if a, if a dot is above the line, that means it's a species that's at risk of oil spills. If it's below the line, it means it's safe, OK? So let's look at common MERS. So common MERS were about 65% of the carcasses that were recovered after the Nestucca spill, the single largest amount, okay? But at that same time of year, which is winter, not summer, in winter, they only make up about 6 to 7% of the dead birds on the beach. So if there hadn't been a spill there, the birds would have been safe. So we know that point falls way above the line. The MERS are at high, high risk of oil spills, and we can use the coast baseline to say that. At the same time, we can look at northern fulmars. Now, northern fulmars made up um, less than 1% of the birds that came in after the Nestucca spill, really low. But at the same time, they make up about 40% of the birds that are found normally on the beach. This tells us that fulmars are doing something when there's an oil spill, they may be moving offshore and getting out of harm's way. So this is a bird that's safe. And it's the coast baseline data that's allowing us to look at who's at risk and who's safe, and thus allow agencies to make determinations of which birds to protect. Here's another so what, and that's um, fisheries interactions. So there's a lot of commercial fisheries and recreational fisheries in the Pacific Northwest. And they catch fish, but they also catch birds. Um, and so here um, are some data from a 2010 fishery wreck that happened in Boundary Bay. So right up at the border, so here's the Washington-Canada um, border. Boundary Bay is that bit of water that's kind of owned by us and them. Um, and we have coast uh, sites all around here. Um, in Boundary Bay in 2010, we said got lots of MERS that washed up on the beaches there. And that's a rather uncommon event. And what we could do was, working with the uh, fisheries, we could look and see whether the timing of those birds washing in uh, was well-timed with the fishery landings. That is, are we actually seeing more birds when we have higher fishery landings? So if you look at this 
graph here on the low part in the blue, you can see the bird body count. So the longer a blue tongue here, the more birds that were counting on a particular day. And each bar is a day. Up here above in green, you can see fishery landings. So the longer the bar, the more fish that are landed. And each different color in this bar tells us that it's a different fishery type. Now one thing to note is that we're actually missing the Canada data and the U.S. treaty data. So that there are more landings that are happening here. But what you can see in general, I hope, is when you have landings, you tend to have birds that are washing in. Although there are some times that we've got fisheries and not many birds washing in. So what happened in 2010? Two things. One is it was a bumper year for salmon and everybody and their brother was out there fishing. So we had a lot more effort. Um, and so more landings, more time, more nets means that we're more likely to get birds. But the other thing that happened was the thing that brought all the fish in, we think also brought the birds in. So although there were a lot more salmon, there were also a lot more MERS um, in Boundary Bay at that time. So the coast data allow us to see that. Here's another so what, um, the effects of harmful algal blooms. Now harmful algal blooms are something that we really worry about. Lots of harmful algal blooms are toxic um, and that toxicity gets into shellfish. That's why we close beaches. You can't go out razor clamming all the time. Sometimes in the summer you can't get oysters or clams because they have toxins built up in them. Um, there's another kind of harmful uh, algae and it's this guy here. It's a dinoflagellate and it looks a little bit like an egg and when that egg breaks open in heavy surf, um, it releases the cell um, interior and um, this cell secretes a sticky sort of soap-like substance that whips up in heavy surf to create foam like you can see in this photograph here. So it sort of looks like a huge latte took over the ocean. Um, and this foam gets all over the feathers of birds and wets down those feathers. It's as if you went swimming in the middle of the winter in the ocean in a wetsuit and suddenly you swam through foam and the foam dissolved the wetsuit, right? So you would be very cold very fast. Um, and that's what happened to these birds. Uh, coast data and coasters who were first responders all along the outer coast in Washington um, were able to put that story together and um, through some uh, oceanography and also some statistical modeling, we were able to estimate that that single event killed over 8,000 birds. That is the single largest bird mortality event from a harmful algal bloom anywhere in the world ever, right? And it happened on the Washington outer coast in 2009. And the reason we know that is because coasters were out there collecting the data. The fourth so what is assessing climate impacts. Now this is something that a lot of people are worried about, global warming, are things getting warmer? Of course there's a lot of noise in the climate signal, but every uh, now and then we have um, climate events that are also affecting the birds. So here is a graph that shows you one of those years and that one of those years was 2005. So this graph is a little difficult to interpret. Let me walk you through this. You're looking at months here from January through to November. So each one of these segments here is a month. Um, these different colored bars correspond to different places on the outer coast um, with dark red being northern Washington and yellow being southern Washington. So a bar that's high tells you that there's more carcasses than normal and a bar that's low tells you there are less carcasses than normal. What do you see in 2005? 2005 we got a whole bunch of birds that washed up in the spring. Bad time of year if you want to, uh, if you're a bird, right? That's the time when you should be fat and sassy and just getting ready to breed. You should not be dying. You should not be washing in on the beach. You probably should be washing in on the beach after the breeding season is finished. This is when inept chicks are going to die because of lack of food and tired parents who can't quite make it through will also wash up. But we didn't see very many and that's because everybody died in the spring. Nobody bred that year and so we had less birds than normal um, washing in after the breeding season. Again, coast data allows us to assess that climate. So I hope I have convinced you that citizen science, rigorous citizen science, where the data are verifiable, um, can tell us a lot um, about what's going on. And that's because we go through observation by the citizens, assessment by the scientists, public education by both of us, 
and calls for change um, from the citizens. And this is the future, I think, of COAST. We are thinking not only about dead birds. I mean, gosh, if we can get 650 people on the beaches looking for dead birds, imagine what we could do if we actually branched out into things that were a little more socially tolerable um, than that. Imagine every coastal community with people who are collecting all sorts of information um, that we saw in real time um, so that we could actually uh, get the pulse of what is going on in the coastal environment. Thank you so much. Uh, I saw this film recently where they uh, took these seabirds in South Pacific, cut them open, and they're filled with plastic. And so it made me wonder about the birds dying on the coasts here. Do you have any idea why, what's killing them? Other than oil, obviously. Yeah, okay, so a few things to say about that. First, let me um, comment about, about plastics. Um, plastics in the guts of, um, of seabirds are actually a really large problem, and mainly for a group of birds that um, uh, it's pretty circumglobal. The prosilureids, if you're a bird person, and if you're not, we call them the tube noses, and that's because their nostrils are a little tube that sit on top of their beaks. So that includes albatross, um, that we see sometimes here, and fulmars, and shearwaters, and tiny little denizens of the Pacific Northwest fork-tailed storm petrels. Um, and those guys tend to fly around, and a lot of them eat fish eggs. Um, and fish eggs are us usually very brightly colored, like yellow or orange or red. Um, flying fish, uh, half-beaks, fish like that. And, and the eggs are very sticky, and they stick to um, pieces of seaweed and um, pieces of drift, uh, and, the, and the birds are queuing in on those colors. And so when they see little plastic pieces, we call them nurdles, uh, that are the same color, they'll eat those. Also when they see cigarette lighters that are red and yellow, like Bic lighters, they'll think that those are fish eggs and they'll eat those. And so we, that's why we tend to get plastics that build up in the guts. Um, of those birds. Now, many of those birds, when they're adults, they can regurgitate that back out. Think Bill the Cat hairball kind of thing. Um, but uh, if you're a chick, you can't do that. So if you go to the albatross colonies that are in Hawaii, um, if, you're, if you're ever lucky enough to get to the northern Hawaiian Islands, to Midway, for instance, um, to see the albatross there, what, one thing that you'll notice is that there's plastic all around all of the nests. Um, and that's because um, the parents are coming back, feeding the kids both fish and plastic, and the chicks fill up with plastic. So um, if it's a heavy plastic year, chicks can actually die, not because the plastic itself is killing them, but because it's basically filling up the gut, leaving no room for, for food. Um, so plastic is a, is a very, very serious issue, and one that we're trying to to figure out. But what kills most of the birds? It turns out that um, somewhere between 50 and 75 percent of the carcasses that we see in a normal year, so there's no big harmful algal bloom or oil spill, something like that, um, are, are natural causes. We get a big pulse in the winter time, we call that winter kill, and that's just very stressful conditions um, that increase mortality. So exposure and difficulty feeding. Um, and then we get a um, a peak also at the end of the summer and the early fall. And that reflects what we call post-breeding mortality. And I alluded to it very, very quickly at the end of the talk. And literally that is um, in, a, in a great reproductive year when a lot of chicks come off of a seabird colony, we're going to see a lot of those chicks not survive their first year. Um, so juvenile mortality, young of the year mortality is higher. In seabirds, actually in, in most... Uh, species. Certainly in humans, it's, it's that way. It's one of the things that we worry about, infant and child mortality, and seabirds are, are no different. The second thing that we see is exhausted breeders that just can't get enough to eat. So we see that pulse in the end of the summer, early fall, and then another larger pulse in the winter, and that's about 50 to 75 percent um, of, of mortality. And, th and that, those two pulses have been happening since time immemorial. And then scattered in and among that, the other 25 to 50% are these more pointed,
causes and chronic causes like plastic. Yeah, good point. Peek out from behind here. Um, so after the collecting, photographing, measuring, posing, and so on, what do your citizen scientists do with the carcasses? Because I'm assuming you want to do something with them so they're not counted accidentally again. That is an excellent question. Okay, so two things about that. What do, what do you do with carcasses? Um, well, one thing that we don't do is bury them, and another thing that we don't do is take them off the beach. And that's because, honestly, death is part of the life of the ecosystem, right? So if you took all carcasses away, you'd actually be taking food sources away from a lot of scavengers. Um, everything from bears, um, who frequent many of our beaches, all the way down to those little amphipod beach hoppers that you see sometimes um, when you walk along the beach. So carcasses are providing a source of food, but um, we do have to solve that problem of not counting them again. And so we mark them. We mark each carcass, in fact, individually. So we can tell that carcass number 157 um, at Ocean Shores um, in September is that same carcass the next uh, month when the, when the participants go out. And that's cool because that lets us see how long they last. And that's fun. And the longest carcass... Oh, come on, it's fun. <laughs> the longest carcass um, has lasted more than a year um, on a sandy beach, right? And why is that? That's because on a windy day, when it's not raining, sand blows, right? And so you know this. If you, um, if you were foolish enough, for instance, to let your older sibling um, make you lie down on a sandy beach on a windy day and not move, very soon you would be, in fact, buried. By, by drifting sand. Um, and that happens to bird carcasses and it happens to all sorts of amazing things. So they get buried and mummified and then th that same wind will blow that sand um, back down the beach and expose things again. So we need to mark the carcasses so that we don't count them more than once. Excellent question. Yeah. You mentioned that common muirs had a very high mortality rate and that was across all different causes that I noticed. Mm -hmm. Why particularly, particularly is that bird so susceptible? Yeah, why are common murs so um, susceptible? You, you'd think with all of the ones that were dying, they would be the uncommon murs, not the common murs. Um, well, okay, so a few things. One is they actually really are common. There are a few million of them that breed um, in Northern California, Oregon, and the outer coast of Washington. So, they're, so there are a lot of them around. Um, but the second thing is that MERS are kind of a canary in the coal mine in, in the Pacific Northwest. So if there's an oil spill or, or a um, or gillnet fishery, um, it's very, very likely that, that we are going to find um, a lot of MERS washing up. So they are actually telling us uh, what's going on um, in the system and making us be careful about the decisions that we're making. And so one one good story about that, it's um, actually two good stories. One is when the Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary um, was dedicated, we actually changed the shipping lanes a little bit so they go out a little farther around the sanctuary before they come in to the Strait of Juan de Fuca and Puget Sound. Um, and so that actually changed um, the chronic oiling rate that we saw on those very, very wild um, beaches along the, the northern outer coast of Washington. The other thing is, because they get caught by, by gill nets, we were really interested in seeing whether we could change the nets. So we actually worked with the fishing community to change gill nets and put a, a really highly visible mesh panel in the top part of a gill net. And so, turns out, if you're a fish, like a salmon, and you see a net in front of you, what do you do? What would you do if you were a salmon and you saw a net in front of you? You would. No, you would dive, dive, like a submarine, dive, dive. So they dive and go right into the monofilament part of the net. So it doesn't change the catch rate of salmon at all. If you're a bird, you're swimming underwater like a merkin, and you see the net, what do you do? Come to the surface. Um, and so that gets them out of the net. So we've actually been able to reduce bycatch um, with use of that vis visible 
mesh panel. And it's only in these years when we see a huge influx of salmon and of MERS at the same time, like in 2010 in Boundary Bay, that we, that we see um, fisheries. So they're actually doing a little better. I'd like to hear a little bit more about the volunteers. Um, what's in it for them? Why do they, when you talk to them, what is the main reason why they keep coming back and going out on what I imagine are a lot of cold, miserable, wet days? Why are they doing this? Right, so um, why be a coaster and, and why, why stay a coaster? Well, other than, of course, the holiday card, which I have already mentioned. Um, <laughs> You know, that might, that might get you through the summer months. Um, some of our coasters, particularly uh, on the coast of Oregon in the fall, um, there will be four or five uh, volunteers out on a beach at a time, and they'll often be out for six to eight hours at a time. And it's stunningly amazing. So, so why do that? We've asked them that, and they say a few things. Um, the, the single uh, most uh, often answered um, answer that we get is that they feel that the data are worthwhile and they're being used. Um, and I think that this is actually really an important thing. If you're going to ask people to spend their time doing something, they want to know that that effort is worthwhile um, and that they're going to take, um, that we're going to take their data and move it on, not only in the science chain in, in academics, but also in, in decision making. So for instance, the coasters that were out there during the harmful algal bloom, it was horrific for them. Not only were they, um, those are beaches where you have to drive a few hours, park your car, hike in for an hour or two, and then do the survey on the beach. And they were going back multiple times in a week um, for several weeks to do that. So just really, really a, a superlative effort. Um, but they knew that we needed that level of data to be able to go testify in front of the um, state legislature and then the Wildlife Commission to see whether we could get the, the duck hunting regulations for sea ducks changed in that year because there were so many birds dying. And so we needed that data right away. And they were very willing to participate. And in fact, we got in front of the Wildlife Commission and we, we made a difference that year. So taking citizen data and using it to make a difference I think is really, um, really where it's at. I think of this century as the century of citizen science. So last century to me was the century of academic science. But we have a lot more people and we have a lot more problems. And there's no way that the scientists are gonna be able to solve all those problems. And those problems are impinging everybody. You hear about them every day, right? In the newspaper, for those of us in the audience old enough to remember that you could get newspapers not online, um, uh, or, or you know, even on your favorite website. And so being part of a program that allows you to be an agent of change, I would say, is a really, really important thing. And so I'm really excited about all of the citizen science that we're going to see um, in this century. Um, this is really cool stuff, and I'm wondering if you're seeing an uptick recently or um, in recent times of uh, different folks using citizen science to help answer some of these bigger questions. And then um, as a second part of that, I'm wondering how the scientific community, your colleagues at the university, view citizen science. Yeah, that's a really, really good question. Are we seeing more citizen science? Yeah, we definitely are. So um, we started COAST 13 years ago, and there wasn't that much citizen science going on. Lots of citizen engagement, but not much science. Um, and now we see more and more of it. So some of my favorite citizen science proje projects, um, the National Phenology Network, fantastic, fantastic program. And it's concerned with the timing of events, um, and quite specifically, Phenology is the timing of things. Um, the timing of um, when buds burst out and when flowers bloom, that can tell us a lot. If you map that over a broad range, it can tell you a lot about climate. Um, and so that's a really fun thing, the, the National Phenology Network. Um, here in Puget Sound, 
um, one of my favorite citizen science projects is Sound Citizen. It's a chemical oceanography project um, where people are going out and collecting water samples um, and then sending them in to a lab at the University of Washington where we test not only for really fun things like um, spices. Uh, and let me tell you, there are spikes in spices like cinnamon um, that tell us when the major holidays are. There's a huge pumpkin pie signal um, at Thanksgiving and there's another one at Christmas um, that I think must be eggnog. Um, uh, but we can also look at pharmaceuticals, some of the more serious um, chemicals that are ending up in the water. So yes, yeah, citizen science programs are, are popping up all over the place. And how do academic scientists, those ivory tower professionals, um, think about uh, citizen science? Well, you know, there is some obvious skepticism. And I think that there's probably a lot of science that is, um, is too arcane for citizens to be involved in. That is the amount of training it takes to do whatever it is is, is, is way longer than, than the average person would want to spend. But I think there's lots and lots of long-term monitoring programs um, that lots of people can get involved in. And I would say that my colleagues have gone from being openly skeptical to being openly receptive about how can we, in fact, design our programs so that we can have citizen involvement. And part of that bandwagon is just the realization that I, sitting in my office at the University of Washington, watch, literally watch, data come in every single day of the year on our website um, from our citizens. And my colleagues down the hall that don't have that have to figure out how to get out to their field sites um, and collect that information. So scientists that are, especially that are doing long-term monitoring, that don't involve citizens, they're missing out. Yeah. Hi. Hey. So I'm inspired to go out and collect data. Uh, I live in downtown Seattle, and it would be great to be able to collect data where I didn't have to drive somewhere. It looks like the closest places are Smith Cove and Alki, uh, Alki Point. Uh, I'm wondering if birds wash into the pocket beaches in Myrtle Edwards or in any other pocket be beaches. Yeah, they definitely do. Pocket beaches are um, a little bit of a problem for us, and that's because, as the name implies, they're really, really small. Um, and so when we're creating an average measurement, right? So how do you compare a little beach and a medium-sized beach and a, and a big beach? What we do is we standardize the length. So we um, create a measurement so that um, if you've got a half a kilometer beach, we double the number of birds you find, right? So we standardize everything to one kilometer. Um, and so if you've got a little pocket beach and it's only two or 300 meters long, then you can see that that multiplier would go way up artificially high. On the other hand, pocket beaches are, are little collectors um, of stuff as well. Um, so yeah, there aren't, I would say, an overwhelming number of beaches right here um, in Seattle. Um, although there are a bunch of them, we also um, man Discovery Park and Car Keek, um, Alki, which I think that you mentioned. Um, there are some beaches over on Vashon um, and Bainbridge as well. Um, some actually really interesting beaches over there. So if you don't want to drive but you want to take a ferry ride, um, that might be something to do. So if you look on our website, www.coastwith2s.org, um, you can see the beaches that we're already manning, um, or you can contact us directly um, to go, go out with us um, on a training. Um, are there any other organizations that um, use COAST's data? Um, certainly there are a lot of um, s local, state, and federal agencies that use COAST data. So um, NOAA uses our data, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife uses our data, U.S. Fish and Wildlife uses our data. And they do things like um, use it to assess threatened and endangered species, for instance. Um, we also work with a bunch of other scientists 
who um, use our data and or who ask us to do additional things. So a good example of that is um, we worked with some geneticists who wondered about a bird called a western grebe. And western grebes uh, breed in the interior, but after the breeding season they come out to the outer coast. Um, and western breed, grebe populations have been declining, specifically in Puget Sound. And so one question is, um, is, is that the population from one breeding location or from several breeding locations? That's a genetic study. And the poor woman who was trying to do this study was literally thinking, wow, I'm going to have to go to beaches by myself and find grebes that are washed up um, and collect a sample. And that's overwhelming. But she found us, and we deputized a whole bunch of our volunteers, and in one fall winter period collected um, genetic samples from over 100 grebes. Um, so that's a way that COAST can, in fact, work with scientists who have specific questions um, and get them the samples that they need. Um, back in 1975, I was out in the Gulf of Alaska on a NOAA boat, and uh, uh, I was a deck officer, and I saw that there was this huge cloud on the radar, and it turned out to be some kind of seabird. Mm -hmm. And we had a bird observer on board, and, he, and if I remember correctly, he thought it was maybe six to eight million birds in that, in that cloud. Yeah. Are there still clouds like that, and what... This is probably um, out in the Lucianary Gulf of Alaska or Bering Sea. And what type of bird was that likely? Okay. Wow. Um, well, the answer to your first question, are there still clouds of basically a bazillion birds, something that would actually darken the sky and, and a dense enough cloud that you can see it on radar? Absolutely. Absolutely. Definitely um, in Alaska. And occasionally we can see smaller versions of that off the Washington coast. Um, so I've got two guesses, actually three guesses, um, depending on where you were in the Aleutians, about what that bird was. Well, my first guess is shearwaters. So shearwaters are a bird that breed in the southern hemisphere, but they fly all the way up to Alaska, out the Aleutians, and um, also up into the Bering Sea, two species predominantly. And they breed in um, Chile, but they also breed in, in New Zealand and um, Australia. So mutton bird is the common name in New Zealand for, for shearwaters. And there are tens of millions of them. And they form very, very dense flocks of birds. So that's my first guess. The, in fact, the largest wreck, which is a, um, a, a massive inwashing of beach birds, usually of one species in a single location, that we've ever recorded was um, on Unalaska, um, which is where Dutch Harbor is. Uh, and Dutch Harbor, by the way, is the, um, the largest fishery port that we have in the US because that's where all the pollock are landed. So we had 1,600 birds per kilometer wash in. I mean, just think about that. You are literally knee deep in birds, but over a very, very small stretch. And it's because the sheer water clouds are so dense um, that when they starve because there's not enough food. They wash in densely. But there are also a lot of birds that breed very densely in the Aleutians, um, relative of the shearwater northern fulmars. There are about 10 million of those um, in Alaska, and still that population is, has been stable over about 30 years. Um, and then there are um, four species of very small um, birds called auklets. So if you're out in the outer Aleutians towards Adak, um, you would have, or Kasatochi, you would have seen, um, so they're about um, the size of a quail. And they, when they're coming in at night, um, so as, as dusk is going down, and you know in the summer in Alaska, it's, it's, it's dark at about 2.30 or 3 in the morning and it's sort of dusky. They will completely fill the sky. I mean, and there's nowhere that you can look that's not just bird everywhere. You kind of wonder where the air is because there are so many birds. And, and those birds um, are still there now. Yeah. We have time for about one more question. Anyone want the last question? Oh, right here. Yes. Uh, you said the DNA uh, in the grief. You, at the end of your talk, you alluded to 
possible other expansions and directions you'd like to go with. Yeah. Could you, ex could you uh, expand on that? Yeah, well, um, certainly working with my friend Rick Kyle, um, the chemical oceanographer I mentioned that has a Sound Citizen project, that's great to think about collecting water samples. But we also think about, and this gets back to the issue of plastics. Um, so we see all sorts of marine debris that washes up on the beach. And there are lots of citizen engagement projects to go out and collect that debris and take it off the beach, which is a really good thing. But one of the things that we'd like to do is be able to get a little better handle on exactly what's there and how often it washes in and where it comes from and how harmful it is to wildlife. Imagine that we could map the beaches of high harm um, and know what times of year were highest harm so that we could take citizen engagement effort and place it in those places to clean up, right? Imagine that we could do that. Think about the effects of the tsunami in Japan, right? So that was an extremely tragic event, but one of the things that it did is take a huge amount of material from the land and suck it out into the ocean. And that material is making its way across the North Pacific, and it's stuck right now in a place in the ocean where the currents tend to go around called the garbage patch. And that we know that garbage patch will be burping out um, very, very large amounts of garbage. And they will end up, that garbage will end up on Pacific Northwest beaches um, and, and Alaska beaches. So one of the things that we think about is, could we extend to monitoring marine debris so that we actually had a marine debris baseline? So we knew when the tsunami um, debris was coming our way. We also think about invasive species. Um, we think about monitoring um, all sorts of shellfish because they leave, of course, their shells behind. Um, uh, we already do monitor marine mammals, but fortunately for us, there aren't that many of those um, washing up on the beaches. So there are all, anything that you can think of that would end up on a beach um, that we can come up with an identification key for um, we can monitor. It's really fun to think about. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you to Julia. Thank you. Thanks for coming out tonight. Thanks.